Hello, welcome to episode five. We're going to be talking about the, the main group today, uh, which sounds very important. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Andrew Boris. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Bern, uh, but I'm originally from the UK. I did uh, my undergrad and PhD at the University of Kent, then moved to Edinburgh for a postdoc and then spent a year in Toronto for a postdoc before moving to Switzerland. Uh, and uh, I'm Tom, uh, I am a PhD student uh, in the UK, currently at the University of Nottingham, uh, where I work on, uh, as you'll see, uh, some organophosphorus chemistry. Um, I did my undergraduate up in the north of England in uh, a city called Durham, and then moved down to Nottingham for my PhD, uh, which hopefully should be finished fairly soon. Uh, my name is Brian Tooten. Uh, I'm originally from the US, um, did my undergrad uh, at West Virginia Wesleyan College, uh, then moved about a thousand miles north to the University of New Hampshire, where I did my PhD. Uh, I did my first postdoc across the ocean, another couple thousand miles away uh, at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Um, and then from Germany, I decided to jump across the other ocean and went over the Pacific and landed down here in Australia. Um, and so I'm a DECRA fellow here. And so this is the first full year of my independent career. So I've just started transitioning out of the postdoc role and learning how the sausage is made on the other side, so. I'm Oliver, as you know, the co-host, <laughs> and I'm a um, student here at uh, EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. People, people still comment confused whether you're gonna be in the episode or not. You know, even though every episode you're like, hello, I'm the co-host, I'm here every episode. <laughs> this is episode five. <laughs> people are still like, is that Oliver guy gonna be there this time? Yes, yes. <laughs> I can't do this on my own. <laughs> be way too awkward if it was just me can you imagine <laughs> we need we, i feel like we need as always a slight approximate knowledge of of what we're going to be talking about today so i have uh you know a wikipedia main page here is there is there any particular article that we need to jump to because you can imagine like when we did computational chemistry or like X-ray crystallography, we had to explain what X-ray crystallography was and a synchrotron is, all that other background stuff so that you could actually, people could talk about their research. Here with the main group, I think... For... I mean, people know what phosphorus is, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, so so where are we? Periodic table, let's, let's go Wikipedia. This is showing my complete lack of knowledge. Like the main group is what? Phosphorus to phosphorus no, and sulfur? S&P so the whole S and P block. So silicon as well. You count as the main group. Yeah, as well. Boring. So anything that's basically not a metal, yeah, not, not, not like a noble gas. Yeah, yeah. aluminium is still the, in the main group, and so is um, thallium or lead. We, it's basically organic chemistry, just with one of those S or P block elements, but we're not really interested in carbon. So I don't. We wouldn't really class carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen or even sulfur sometimes as main group chemistry because they're quite popular in like naturally occurring organic molecules. So it's more of a slightly heavier uh, S and P block elements that we're more interested in. And like some stuff is very much organic chemistry with one atom replaced with the main group element. Other stuff is very far from that. If I type so main grouping. Sometimes you have pretty, um specific main group element which the lighter elements like um the exotic nitrogen compounds where it's mostly just nitrogen for example so nitrogen oxygen and fluorine it's like sort of yes but no one in no one doing like fluorine chemistry would be like oh, i'm a i'm a main group chemist is that kind of how you say it works i would say that's fair yeah they call themselves fluorine chemists or <laughs> yeah they, they they like to be separate I and mean, yeah like, yeah so no. Well, to be fair, after some of the chemistry I've seen chlorine chemists do, I would like to be separate from them as well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen them on Twitter, you know, they like to be separate. <laughs> Why is there this distinction on saying oh, I'm, a, I'm a main group chemist? Like what's what's the like predominant sort of grouping sort of characteristics you'd say? Is it just because that's where they are on the product table? What's, what's the kind of like thing that I suppose groups it all together? It's, it's, it's a good question, really. I think people just like to kind of put themselves in, in boxes of what they do, I, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I guess in the main group, depending on your point of view, you can argue whether you've got kind of D orbitals like metals have that are involved in things or not. Um, there's there's a, a debate that goes on there. 
Um, <laughs> by training, I'm kind of an organic chemist, but now I would call myself now like an organophosphorus specifically uh, chemist. So, or, or organo main group. I've done some organo boron chemistry in the past. The organo bit generally is the you know carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, um, just with a phosphorus in there. I've sort of found myself in main group chemistry, I say. <laughs> Do you get like accepted by the organic chemistry community? Like if you try and go to an organic like a total synthesis conference do, do people kind of go oh my god these gross elements that aren't carbon and oxygen you know <laughs> is it all just kind of blend into the same you know you're kind of using similar techniques or oh I, for me i would say that i am the the bastard child of bastard children um <laughs> i i am definitely always the stupidest person in the room when it comes to the main group because i kind of accidentally walked into that room i'm traditionally an organic chemist um, and then turned into a polymer chemist. So the organic chemists always make it clear that us polymer chemists are their bastard children. Um, they, we always have the ugliest NMRs because they're lumpy and they're gross. Um, so beyond that, I kind of did something sacrilegious where even as a polymer chemist, you're supposed to use only carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, and I've kind of accidentally found myself working my way down the group 16 elements, kind of collecting them like Pokemon cards. Um, so I started as working in, in sulfur and doing sulfur chemistry and then accidentally found myself doing selenium chemistry. And I actually have some, some tellurium ideas in the future, but I think I'll stop at tellurium because I don't know too many polonium chemists that are currently alive. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Just to finish up with this, is there any techniques that you guys talk about that we think you need to be introduced is there any sort of fundamental techniques in this in this area that um you know that's i mentioned it in my slides but uh, a lot of the chemistry we do is very air and moisture sensitive so either the compounds we use to prepare certain things or normally even the compounds that we're trying to target are very air and moisture sensitive so we have to use uh what's called a schlenk line a lot of the time no. i can't spell so like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is, I actually have a website on it. Um, I, know, I was going to say, I'm surprised it's not yeah, your picture in this corner. Your, your, your guide is very good on this. Yeah, it so is. for people who don't know, it's just, yeah, it allows you to do all your chemistry and under a dry condition with like an inert gas such as uh, nitrogen or argon. So it, it's very different. Like obviously some organic chemists do use shrink lines for their stuff. They still have to use pyrophoric reagents for their stuff, but it's not like we solely have to use these a lot of the times or uh, use glove boxes as well. So that's kind of the difference I would say between organic and main group chemistry is that, yeah, we, it's a lot more sensitive. Yep. Yeah. I think maybe for mine, um, like, like, uh, like I mentioned, I kind of don't fit in anywhere. But for the slides that you'll see from mine, um, maybe step growth polymerization is something to maybe know what that is. Um, there's two main types of polymerizations in the polymer world. One is chain growth, one is step growth. Yeah. Chain growth means you start with, you, you start at one monomer. Yeah, there you go. So, so that first oh, yeah. picture right there, that first picture that was on the top of the page is yeah. chain growth. So you start with a single monomer and then you add one additional monomer each subsequent step. Typically, when you get polymers that are made in this fashion, they're all relatively mono dispersed, meaning that they're all relatively the same size. Um, and if you scroll down to the step growth side, um, step growth, the famous one that probably everyone's done either in high school or their first year of uni is the nylon rope trick. Uh, so you mix the isocyanide, um, or sorry, the isocyanate and either the amine or the polyol. Um, and you kind of wind it up out of the pencil. Um, but this one, yeah, this is a perfect description or a perfect cartoon. So um, you're reacting from both sides. So you're constantly doubling the length of each chain. So there's a lot of funky math um, into modeling some of these. None of that math I am good at. Um, but most of your industrial polymers uh, are step growth made. So your polyesters, polyamides, polyurethanes, Basically, the only chain growth polymers used that you would be familiar with is maybe polyethylene, so like plastic bags. Um, maybe knowing the difference between those two. I'm only going to speak of step growth polymerization today. Um, 
So that's that's maybe a background thing for me, which isn't necessarily main group based, but that is some of the stuff yeah. I'll speak about. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the work that I did when I was in Edinburgh, which is looking at something called the uh, phosphoborovitic reaction. So uh, we kind of spoke about well, this wasn't really mentioned uh, when we kind of introduced main group chemistry, but one of the, I guess, motivations for doing main group chemistry is that the S and P block elements are very abundant. So here's a periodic table that shows the relative abundance. And you can see that uh, when we're looking at uh, some of these elements, so uh, the S block and some of the lighter P block elements, uh, they're very abundant. And this is like, in contrast to transition metals, some of the catalysts that are used for such important reactions all rely on very expensive materials that come from conflict areas. So that's a big motivation. And obviously that means they're more sustainable and they're also generally less uh, less toxic as well. There's some certain themes in uh, main group chemistry that I'd like to introduce. So a lot of main group chemistry is just inter uh, interested in the fundamentals. So like challenging conventional structure and bonding and this often means like making molecules that shouldn't exist and then doing chemistry that we wouldn't expect so as uh, this example here is a, a boralene so boron in the plus ox a plus one oxidation state which can activate dinitrogen and that's something that we thought for a long time was only limited to transition metals this example in the middle is silicon in the plus zero oxidation state. Again, this is just challenges some of the traditional uh, ideas we had about the bonding in these systems. And then there's this example on the right, which are the singlet phosphonidine, so phosphorus in the plus one oxidation state without any additional support. And you can see that they always have these really big bulky ligands, which essentially just completely shield your reactive metal center. Another popular area is uh, catalysis, so doing catalysis without the metals. And I've picked some key examples. So one is uh, something called frustra frustrated Lewis pair chemistry. This is where you have a Lewis acid and a Lewis base, and they're just they're so bulky that they can't come together to form an adult. And you essentially have a pocket in the middle which can activate small molecules. So in this example, it can heterolytically cleave dihydrogen, and then it can uh, transfer the proton and the hydride uh, separately to uh, your desired substrate. And very recently, you can see this was out just a few months ago, we're seeing main group uh, catalysts that can do all the redox events, which is which we thought were only possible in transition metal chemistry. So this is still bismuth, so it's still a heavy main group metal. Uh, but again, this is just, I guess, give you some idea about where main group is going in the future. Another popular theme and something we'll probably hear from Brian is that uh, if we incorporate main group elements into polymers or uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, then we can really start to tune physical properties. So these are used widely in organic electronic devices, uh, polymers, and you can even get sulfur nitrogen radicals, which have shown promise for making essentially metal free or plastic magnets. Now, we mentioned strength line chemistry. So this is what a strength line would look like. Uh, and here's an illustration of what uh, these would involve. So if you want to check out like more information about uh, those techniques, then feel free to check out my guide. Now, related to my research, I guess it's built into that fundamental chemistry is another popular theme is called the isosteer strategy. So this is where we replace carbon atoms with main group elements. So if I, in the example I've shown here, we have an alkyne, and then we can replace the two carbon atoms in the middle with nitrogen and boron, and then we get an amino boron, and then we can go a step further and maybe replace the nitrogen now with phosphorus. And what you do when you do this is you essentially strongly change the structure, which really changes the reactivity of these compounds. So this will do chemistry which alkynes can't do. So that's why these are so, so interesting. They kind of start out as curiosities, but then they lead to interest in reactivity and properties that you wouldn't get in just this purely organic compound. And the stuff that I was in at Edinburgh, we were interested in these phosphoborines. So they're predicted to adopt this bench structure where you have both a phosphorus lone pair, a vacant p orbital and boron, 
and the PB double bond. So this means that we can expect them to be really, really reactive compounds and they should be able to activate um, some quite inert small molecules. But one of the issues with these is that they have a tendency to form oligomers. So you can make monomeric phosphoborines if you stabilize them with a metal Lewis acid, but usually they would form dimers or trimers, or if you just have uh, hydrogen as your substituent, then you just form polymers instead. And I'll mention what these substituents are because they'll become quite uh, important. There were some early mass spectrometry studies that showed that if you take this dimeric phosphoborine and you heat it in the vapor phase, and it does a kind of split into the monomer. Uh, and then previous work in the research group has shown that if you add a Lewis base, uh, then you can start to trap these intermediates. But more interestingly is that you can start to do, I guess, organic chemistry with these compounds. So you can take treat this with the alkyne and you form these compounds here. So this is, uh, I wanted to kind of illustrate uh, some of the synthetic methods or some of the challenges that you might not really uh, understand with main group chemistry. And one of the things is that even to get to your initial material, you can take six, seven, eight steps to get there. So it's kind of like a inorganic total synthesis a lot of the time. So for this case, our, what we call MES start is this uh, super mesotile group. And then we initially brominate it on a very large scale. Add, uh, we can then make the, the phosphine of this and then reduce it down to the primary phosphine. And then we do two more steps to get to our phosphorus component of the phosphoborine. And then we do the same for the boron side. We have this secondary amine and we do a few steps to get to our uh, borane, which we can distill. And then we can prepare our, uh, our target compound, a useful reagent on a, a very large scale. Sadly, it's yellow tongue, but it does some interesting chemistry. Uh, so the stuff I was doing uh, was that if we take this dimeric phosphoborine and we add an, al uh, an aldehyde or a ketone, then we get uh, these compounds here. So this is what you would get from a what we call a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. And you can see that in the crystal structure of these compounds, this four-membered ring is really quite strained. Uh, there's a lot of, one of the benefits of using uh, main group elements is that you can often use uh, heteronuclear NMR. So I have phosphorus and boron in my, com in my compound, so I can use both phosphorus and boron NMR to further track how these reactions progress and to uh, see how pure they are. Now, one of the interesting things about that reactivity is how differently it compares to, I guess, its lighter uh, congener in the main group. So. Uh, phosphorus is one below nitrogen, but you can see that in our case, even though we start with this dimer, we solely get the reactivity of this monomer in solution to form this compound here. Whereas if you do the same thing with the nitrogen equivalent, then you essentially get what would be the four plus two cycle addition. So you end up with a six membered ring instead. And then if we look at the monomeric eminoborane, then this does something completely different. So it reacts with acetone in its enolic form. So you get addition across uh, BN bond in those cases. Now, what was interesting about this chemistry was that if you changed your carbon ion from a ketone or aldehyde to an ester or amide instead, then you don't really form this compound. You can observe small amounts of it in the NMR, but instead you get directly through to this compound here, which is called a phosphoalkene. And the byproduct of this reaction, we can crystallize out, and this is the structure, and this we can also monitor this by NMR. And this allows us to directly prepare uh, known and novel phosphoalkenes quite, uh, quite easily. Now, if there's any uh, organic chemists or people that uh, have some background in chemistry, then they might start to see where this is going. So a very popular reaction in organic chemistry is called the Wittig reaction. So this allows us to take a phosphonium yellid, react it with a carbonyl, you have this intermediate species and then it kind of splits down the middle to release uh, this triphenyl phosphine oxide and gives you your desired uh, alkene. And this is powerful because you can change what R1, R2, X and Y is and you can essentially construct quite complicated molecules this way.
And there's been developments where you can do similar stuff now with phosphorus. So uh, we have what's called a stabilized phosphinidine. Again, they react with carbonyls. You form a similar byproduct, but this time we have a phosphoalkene. So you can see how this compound would be related to this one here. In our case, it's uh, slightly different. Again, we're forming this phosphoalkene, but the byproduct this time is a, a boron oxygen containing product. And we can actually start to isolate some of these intermediates. Now, uh, something that's used quite a lot in uh, main group chemistry and in organic chemistry is uh, we kind of like to support a lot of our findings with DFT studies. So I won't talk about this in too much detail, but it's quite complicated. But we can see that initially this dimer splits to form a monomer. The uh, acetone in this case can kind of coordinate to the boron. And then there's a transition state, and then it goes through to our desired product. And you can see that when these numbers correspond to the relative energies, so uh, we start at zero for our reagents, and the product in this case is lower in energy, so this reaction is favorable. And we can see that to get through to the phosphoalkene and this other byproduct, it's much, much lower in energy. But the problem with this is that you now have a large barrier here. So under the reaction conditions, because we're only heating to 80 degrees, this is about 30 kilocals per mole. So we wouldn't expect to see that in our reaction because it's, uh, because it's such a high barrier. If instead we change to the amides, then it's a slightly different story. So this time, uh, this intermediate four-membered ring is actually higher in, in energy to our uh, reagent. So that means that we, can, we might be able to see it in our solution, but it might be difficult to isolate. And this time the barrier to uh, ring close to cleave this bond in the middle is very low. So this time, if we take these components and heat it, we go all the way down to the phosphoalkene product. We did think, however, that if we had this for the uh, our aldehydes and ketones, then surely there must be a way to make this go into that. And if we just heat it, then we don't see anything. And this is again associated with the high barrier that we had. But we can add certain reagents to this to enable this transformation. So this is a, a phosphorus NMR uh, monitoring the reaction. So this compound here to A initially is at around 20 ppm. And if we add a small amount of this compound here, then we can see that we get a slow but gradual and clean uh, conversion into this compound here. So we get a new peak in the phosphorus in the mar, and this one uh, almost all disappears. And we can also use uh, another reagent. So the, this one here was a Lewis base, and this is now a Lewis acid. Uh, initially, if you just use one whole equivalent, then you get immediate and clean conversion. But we can also see that if you add just uh, a quarter of equivalent and heat it, then we can again get clean conversion through uh, to our desired phosphoalkene. I won't talk about this in too much detail, but what's interesting about this is that for each of these different transformations, there's uh, different mechanisms. So these, again, what we can do is start to relate this to the organic chemistry. So that's what main group chemistry likes to do. We kind of like to compare and contrast to organic chemistry. So these are all based on mechanisms mechanisms which are well developed for uh, organic chemistry. And you can see in all cases, they're all slightly different, but they all lead to the same product. So hopefully I've given you a quick introduction to some of the chemistry that we like to do in the main group. We, we made these phosphoborines, which again, began as curiosities and there's still a lot to be explored with these, but we can show that we can take these compounds, which are quite uh, accessible, we can prepare them on a the large scale and use that to uh, convert these commercially available and widely uh, available uh, materials into phosphoalkenes, which have applications in uh, polymer chemistry and as ligands for catalysis. Uh, so you can, we can start to see why these are quite useful. I would just like to quickly thank all the people that helped me to this specific research. So this was done at the University of Edinburgh in the Cowley Research Group. Uh, this is some of the past and present members. And again, these uh, crystallography and animal spectroscopy were a big help and funding bodies as well were important for this research. Thank you.
Thank you. Is your slank line always that clean or did you take it on a good day? Uh, it's usually quite clean. I think All right. well, this this week I made a bit of a disaster of my slank line. Uh, so, but yeah, obviously, obviously I always take pictures when it's freshly cleaned <laughs> and when the manometer is as low as possible. So I noticed in your reaction diagram, oh, one of them, um, you have a lot of stuff at negative 80 degrees. Is, is, is a lot of your chemistry done sort of at that dry ice, sort of very cold temperatures? Yeah. I'll go back to that. It's, so there's certain steps in here. There's like known transformations that you need to do them cold and that is for selectivity. So uh, this first one here is, this is what we'd call the initial step when we add N-butyl lithium to this compound here is what's known as a lithium halogen exchange. And if you don't do that at low temperatures, then instead you would just end up putting the N-butyl onto here instead which would make the reaction not work. And uh, again, it's the same when we come to this step here. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my laser pointer. This step here. Okay. So we add in this, which would be our nucleophile to our electrophile. And if you don't do it at cold temperatures, you run the risk of putting two or three on instead of just one. And again, it's a safety thing as well. Some of these reagents that I'm showing are quite... Uh, dangerous and pyrophoric so again it's just slow is better for these uh for these reactions but once you've yeah. made the compounds they're fine you don't need to store them cold for example to follow on from that question from chat is what what's the most frustrating task you think in with these long synthesis like what's what's the most frustrating bit is it is it the fact that it has to be cold or is it is there something else that's just really frustrating about this sort of synthesis it's the fact that like you have to be Everything on the shank line takes so much longer. You need to have all your glassware dry. You can't just put it on the line and expect to use it. You need it in the oven for a few hours. You need to cycle it onto the line. So any step you could imagine in beakers on the bench, just pouring one thing to another, it's going to take you five to ten times longer. So it's often the, the time that it takes to make some of these things. And again, that also means that if you're trying to prepare stuff on a large scale, uh, then it's that's another limitation. You can't just do bucket chemistry at that point. You have to, you're, you're limited by the biggest flask you have. You can't have an open flask. So again, that's probably one of the challenges is doing stuff on a big scale, doing it safely, and the time involved in making these things. Obviously, something like to get from the commercially available components to this is going to take a week or two straight and that's just to make something that you're going to consume a lot of um, this is probably a question for that i should ask at the end but i'll ask you now in terms of like you're you're saying that, that you might have applications in in like polymer chem and I, I know you're kind of at the base research but is there difficulty with chemistry like this to try and say oh it could be conducted on a, on an industrial scale is there because of the air sensitivity and the, and the safety things or is that something that industry kind of does work out like you wouldn't yeah. be surprised there's a lot of so like for organolithiums and uh, grignard reagents or even organo aluminium chemistry they're all stuff that are like super pyrophoric very sensitive but because they're so useful and they can't they do chemistry that can't be replaced by other stuff then there's ways around that and even when it comes to applications, yeah, it's hard to see how these would find a direct application, but there's ways around it. There's, even if we look at lithium batteries, for example, the lithium's air and moisture sensitive, but there's ways around, mm. yeah. around that. So it becomes more of an engineering problem at that point. So we don't have to worry yeah. too much about that. Yeah, It's yeah. nice if we can do it at room temperature in air, but until then... Uh, someone else's problem in a naive way. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Oh, that was really cool. so, I loved it. Yeah. It's super cool. Yeah, it's super oh, cool. one Is question. You, uh, yeah, have you, do you do the DFC calculations yourself or do you just um, uh, task uh, a computational <laughs> group to do it for you? <laughs> the post well, privilege. <laughs> no, it, in, well, in this particular one, when my supervisor did them, but I've uh, I've done some of my own computational stuff at the minute. It kind of depends if you have access to the supercomputer and clusters you need for that. I'd like to be able to do them myself. It would probably be a lot quicker, but yeah, normally it's 
if you want it done properly, then it's normally better to get a computational chemist to do them for you, and you can be sure that they're done rigorously that way. Are those two containers in the in the picture in the slide there? Would you call this? Would you class this as large scale, or would, is this about the scale you generally work on? Is I this a big like so record? Yeah, that's that's the like thirty grams of this is a yeah. All right, yeah, scale. yeah. that like, looks like a huge yeah. amount. Yeah, like yeah, <laughs> like some of these are like primary phosphines are very bad compounds. And Tom will talk <laughs> about even worse ones, but yeah, they're 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 very powerful. You'd it probably. I did it safely, I can assure you, but yeah, it's that's part of the challenge. If you, I have to do it at a large scale because I'm using so much of it, but yeah, that's making, <laughs> that would be probably yeah. one of the challenges, I would say, with main group chemistry or some of these reagents. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I have sort of called the talk, yeah, from rat poison uh, to pair stable phosphine surrogates. You'll, you'll see why uh, kind of as I go along. Um, but just a, a kind of intro to, I guess, me and the group in particular that I work in. So I work in uh, the Ball Group at Nottingham, uh, Dr. Liam Ball, that is. Uh, and we kind of do organic chemistry, also some main group chemistry, um, some transition metal catalysis as well, kind of thrown in there uh, too. And, and um, one of, in terms of other main stuff that the group's done uh, recently, um, uh, Andre showed some business chemistry, and that's one of the things that we've been uh, uh, into as well. Um, but yeah, worked on phosphorus, um, and just a little bit, I guess, first of all, about uh, me. So I'm originally from uh, this part of the UK here called Lincolnshire. Um, there's not a lot there, um, and uh, it's kind of quiet. Um, I moved up to do my um, undergraduate master's degree so uh, that's a four-year uh, up in the northeast in, in Durham um, and I guess my kind of first taste of research was doing or trying to do uh, some amino acid synthesis um, and then during my master's year I did some organic boron chemistry uh, up there which was really fun um, and then I kind of hadn't had enough of research so I moved down back to uh, Nottingham here um, uh, where I did, I'm doing my PhD, uh, and I work on uh, kind of organophosphorus chemistry, along with some uh, transition metal catalysis. But today, uh, with the main group part, uh, we'll uh, talk about the organophosphorus chemistry. And really, um, the reason why I kind of do what I do is that compounds like these two on the right here, these bulky uh, tertiary alkyl phones, are really useful for um, various different areas of catalysis. So uh, again, Andrew mentioned some uh, frustrated Lewis pairs. One of the uh, ones that did quite a lot in that as a Lewis base component is this triterbutyl phosphine here. Um, and then uh, this is also used as a ligand for transition metal chemistry. Um, and the way that that's made generally uh, isn't that fantastic. So generally, we start with phosphorus trichloride, um, which I'll show you what's wrong with that in just a second. Um, and that's used as a kind of source of P3+, plus, if you like, um, since the, uh, the chlorides are all kind of the uh, finest part of that. And then the, we react that with these Grignard reagents, which kind of act as the C- minus component. Um, and the, the kind of first ingredient you make and isolate is this uh, diterbutyl chlorophosphine, uh, which itself isn't very, very nice. You see the yield's pretty low. You can get it to work slightly better. This is from a pattern from the 60s, um, but uh, <laughs> everyone loves the 60s. Uh, but uh, the, uh, and then you can take that and you can reduce it to uh, uh, lithal um, and make this uh, secondary phosphine here. Alternatively, with a bit of uh, copper in there, you can push it all the way to the uh, triterbutyl phosphine or going all the way back to the start. Uh, now with quite a lot of these metal salts um, that you chuck in, which ultimately are just thrown away, um, you can get a fairly good yield of that compound. Um, but I'll just show you some kind of crude hazard symbols, if you like, for why we don't like doing this kind of stuff. So uh, this is just to emphasize like water sensitivity, obviously, air sensitivity. Um, phosphorus trichloride itself is also a controlled substance. It's a chemical weapon precursor, so it's um, it controlled quite rigorously uh, in a lot of places. The Grignard reagents, the intermediates, 
uh, lithal uh, oil, not very nice to work with. And in fact, the products even of this, uh, as Andre mentioned earlier, uh, these two in particular are pyrophoric as well. So uh, you expose those to them and they will catch fire. Um, so not very nice chemistry, really. Um, we kind of came at this from uh, an interesting point of view in that rather than using a P plus and a C minus to make compounds like this, could we kind of flip that round uh, and use a P minus and a C plus? Both of those are kind of more what we call natural in terms of the reactivity. Phosphorus has a lone pair on it uh, when it's phosphorus three, um, which kind of suggests it might be better as a P minus. Um, and we know that we can make carbon relatively positive by putting a leaving group on it, for example. And so I started out with uh, this compound here. This is tris trimethylsilylphosphine, uh, and that's a P3 minus equivalent, if you like. Uh, reacted that with uh, a mixture of terbutyl acetate, which is an industrial solvent that's used on massive, massive scale, uh, and combined with uh, TMS triflate, that's trimethylsilyl triflate there that makes a carbocation effectively it eliminates the acetate and you end up with a carbocation and i'd love to tell you that um, this was the kind of product that we got but actually what we see uh, is this uh, compound instead this phosphonium now salt um, which was very interesting we had kind of a few questions there isn't an obvious source of these hydrogens in this system uh, so we kind of wondered where those came from uh, and as well as that we wondered why it only goes twice. Like, why can't we get the third alkyl group on there? And I'm happy to, to talk about that. Um, but the great thing about phosphorus, as Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, is that it's NMR active. 100% uh, of phosphorus that's naturally occurring is phosphorus 31. Uh, so we can use it for uh, looking at reactions by NMR spectroscopy. So I did that. And um, as soon as I got this reaction set up and down onto the instrument, um, I saw this lovely quartet here in the first spectrum, uh, which is really lovely until you realize that it's pH3, um, which is phosphine gas, which for reference is horrendously toxic and also horrendously pyrophoric. Um, and I had an NMR tube full of it that wasn't particularly sealed amazingly well. <laughs> um, so I did NMR tube just for reference, just a really thin glass tube, you know. Um, and so I thought well, I'll just wrap it up a bit better <laughs> um, and kind of leave it because I know that eventually I get some of this stuff out. Um, and so I'll just watch it over time, you know, and then see what happens. Um, and indeed, after a little bit of time, you see it starts to see a buildup of uh, a, a peak here. This is very noisy, but I'll explain in a second. And then uh, see a, a buildup of this compound. Um, and this uh, compound is it's, again really interesting in the NMI. You see it's the a triplet and there's three peaks here but then within that triplet there's this kind of regular structure of peaks um, and so we call that a, a triplet of what is a regular multiplet um, and it in fact comes from the phosphorus it's kind of coupling to these two hydrogens here to make the triplet and then 18 equivalent protons on the tertiary butyl groups uh, so it would be a 19 at if you could see the whole thing um, and Again, we kind of had a few questions at this point. I should say, yeah, the reason why it's so noisy uh, is that this product actually crystallizes out in the NMR tube um, of the mixture. And so you actually, you know, solid stuff in an NMR tube isn't very good for the signal, as you'd imagine. Um, so we wondered from that whether we could just start with phosphine gas directly, because this stuff um, actually is quite expensive uh, if we wanted to buy more of it. Um, now, in reality, we had a bit of a supply and you can make this stuff um, but uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, a pyrophoric liquid, uh, which means it's stored and handled all under uh, inert conditions. If anything, though, moving towards phosphine gas kind of presented more problems. Um, we'd have to buy it from a specialist supplier, which inevitably means the high cost for us. Rather than a liquid, it's a pyrophoric gas. So again, handling it is difficult. Uh, it comes in a cylinder, so we need to buy all of the kit to hook that up to a line of some sort. Uh, and then deal with it at the end. Um, on top of that, I work in this building here um, at Nottingham, which is called the Carbon Neutral Lab. Um, it's made of quite a lot of wood. Um, and indeed, while it was being built, um, there was a small issue that happened while they were about 70% 70 70 rather of the way through building it. Um, so we were keen to not repeat that. Um, and 
use kind of a surrogate for the gas instead. And one that really stood out to us uh, was zinc phosphide. Um, that's because it's dirt cheap, basically. It's 50 pounds for a kilo from Sigma Oil Retrievement. Uh, and uh, it's actually used as a rat poison. This isn't the stuff we use, I should say. Um, this is just a picture that I found of it in its other use. Um, it's air and moisture stable. Uh, and in fact, it is just stored you know, on the bench in a, in a big tub. And although it's water stable, when you need it, you can just add acid, uh, which completely um, uh, protolyzes it, if you like, to phosphine gas. And the great thing about solid, of course, that's air stable is you can weigh out exactly how much you need, so you know exactly how much gas you're making. Um, so I'll just show you how I kind of set these reactions up. Um, this is a two-chamber reactor. Um, it was kind of originally developed for using carbon monoxide, but uh, other people have used it for uh, hydrogen cyanide, acetylene, hydrogen, sulfur fluoride, gases that you don't necessarily want to deal with a cylinder of. The idea is always the same. You put your material to generate the gas in one side. So in my case, the zinc phosphide goes in one side of the reactor. When everything else is ready, just add some aqueous HCl, which generates the phosphine gas. Uh, the gas then travels between the two chambers. Here's just a picture. It's a larger version of the glassware, but here's a picture of what that kind of looks like as it's going this grayish brown suspension. And then on the other side is the alkylating mixture. Um, and then at the end of the reaction, um, you just take the stuff out of this side uh, and crash the product out or crystallize it out. Uh, and here's uh, what those phosphonium salts look like. Um, so I can make quite a few uh, of these type of structures and um, there's more than this. These are the ones that I have uh, crystal structure data for. Um, and uh, again, this is just showing the cation part uh, uh, there. Uh, one that I wanted to point out because it's interesting uh, is this one. Um, the starting material in terms of this like alkyl part ultimately comes from this compound. Uh, it's called cedrol, uh, and it comes from the oil of cedar wood. Uh, it's produced on a kiloton scale every year from, from that source. Uh, and we're able to take that uh, and in just two steps, making an acetate and then doing this reaction, we make it into a useful um, starting material for um, phosphorus chemistry. Um, so initially uh, from that result, we were kind of sort of disappointed in a way that we couldn't make those tertiary phosphines, as I've mentioned earlier, with all three substituents. But actually, when we thought about what I had made, I have these you know, air stable, crystalline, solid materials that are you know more than happy for well over now two or three years even. Whereas if you just take the proton from there, the free phosphine is a pyrophoric liquid, as I mentioned earlier. And even kind of better than that um, is that what you make this from, uh, that you know your phosphorus trichloride, your grignard reagents, your lithium aluminium hydride, all of that is air and moisture sensitive and not very nice to work with. Whereas these phosphonium salts that I made come from zinc phosphide rat poison. And the uh, tertiary alkyl acetates, which in some cases are even like flavor and fragrance ingredients. Um, and uh, the only thing that's a bit touchy that goes in is the TMS triflate. And then all you need to do to access all of the chemistry of these compounds, which there is a lot of, is to deprotonate kind of in your next reaction. And as long as it's inert at that stage, everything's fine. Um, so, one thing that I can do with them uh, is make these. Um, uh, ligands by uh, coupling on a third group, in this case a, an aryl group rather than an alkyl. Um, and then I made that with a range of different R groups on the phosphorus. And um, then one thing I thought was really important was then to compare them, because it's all well and good to be making loads of compounds, but if they're all more or less the same, then there's no real value there. Uh, so I, what I did was reacted it with this gold complex and made these um, gold compounds. and uh, uh, then you can crystallize those really nicely. Generally, they crystallize really well. Here's a big picture of um, a really, really big crystal, actually. Far too big for the crystallographer to deal with, so we had to break it, sadly. Um, but what we can do then is, is uh, get the data back from the crystallographers. Uh, here's a couple of them. You can see the R groups on the phosphorus. Phosphorus is this one. Uh, a methyl cyclopentyl. Uh, and then over here, a uh, like ethyl pentyl uh, substituent there. Um, and although we kind of show that data like that most of the time, um, what they really look like in terms of electron clouds is something more like this. Um, and 
then using a piece of software um, that's available on the web, um, we're able to put an imaginary sphere around that gold atom. And then we ask the software, how much of the volume of that sphere is taken up by atoms in the ligand, basically. In other words, what's the buried volume around that gold? And so we can do that for the range of ligands that I made. Uh, and you can see the two that are currently commercially available um, are these two in gold here, and the ones that I've made are in blue. Um, so we can make a wider range of steric, so the size of the molecule, uh, than what is available at the moment. As well as that, we looked at electronics. And one way to do that is to react the phosphine with uh, elemental selenium, uh, which makes a phosphine selenide. So uh, selenium, of course, in the same group with oxygen. Uh, phosphines will react with oxygen to make phosphine oxides, in this case, make a phosphine selenide. Uh, so here is just an NMR spectrum of the free phosphine where uh, this is the R group there on the phosphorus. Uh, and after reacting that with selenium, you can see, first of all, the chemical shift changes, which tells you you've got a different species. Uh, and also you see these two small peaks here either side of the main peak. And that's because uh, around 8% of selenium is spin active as selenium 77. So the phosphorus interacts with the selenium and a small amount, you can see, um, gets split into this doublet here. And if you measure the coupling constant of that doublet, you get a measure of how electron donating the phosphorus is, or in, in that compound, the phosphine is rather. Uh, again, the two in gold are the commercially available ones, uh, and the ones in blue are the ones that I have uh, made there. And just for reference, the smaller this number, the more electron donating the phosphine is considered to be. Um, so there's lots more that uh, I won't go into here, but um, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, answer. Thanks for listening. Someone asked about the purity of the gas. How pure is the phosphine you make and does it affect your reaction? Yeah, no, it's a good question because the, um, the rat poison or the, the zinc phosphide rather that we get um, comes as sort of technical grade. So, you know, good enough for most purposes, i.e. good enough for killing rats, um, which is about 80%. Um, the rest of that, uh, you can see on here actually, this will, this will be more or less the same stuff we get sold. It just says in the ingredient, 20%. Uh, um, that could be a bit of leftover zinc, um, small amount of leftover phosphorus, things like that. Um, since the reaction to make this stuff is just take phosphorus and zinc and cook them at a very high temperature. Um, and the, uh, so yeah, you can measure the purity in terms of just how much gas is released. Uh, that's how I do it anyway. There's a, potentially, there is some hydrogen in there as well. Um, but I, I checked for that. But with um, NMR, um, and you can't see any free hydrogen. Um, but yeah, the stuff we get is about 80% pure. So if you take that into account, you can work out how much gas you're making. Um, and yeah, whatever else there might be in there doesn't seem to affect any of my chemistry. So I don't ask questions. <laughs> All right, good. How bad does your lab, your lab smell? So say again, how? How bad does your lab smell? <laughs> well, I mean, it's fine. if I contain it well enough, not at all, um, in all honesty, um, very occasionally, um, you know, I've, I've had a whiff of the stuff. It's not very nice. Um, <laughs> Can imagine. That kind of garlicky metallic smell that yeah. things like that are often described as. But, but yeah, generally, it, I, I have my fume hood set to kind of max when I'm setting the reaction up and when I'm purging the phosphine out of there. Um, and generally, I don't have any issues. And the, the phosphoniums salts I make um, are effectively odorless uh, as well. Do, do you have to take any extra precautions with, with the gas in terms of like um, purging it or scrubbing it, or is it just kind of like a few wood and outside, or is it? So, is there... Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. So in um, presuming the reaction goes really well, hopefully you don't have any gas to deal with, but obviously you can't plan for that. <laughs> um, you, you, you always plan for the reaction not going well. So what I generally do um, now, especially because I've also done this on a quite a big scale, um, is that I have like a double bleach bubbler set up. So at the end of the reaction, I kind of pierce the, the, the top of the reactor, um, which is just like a rubber septum, more or less. Um, pierce through that and the gas can go through two sets of bleach bubblers, basically. It's completely uh, kind of purged out uh, before it's released into the air. The building, so so mm -hmm. what? It's a carbon neutral wood building that you do pyrophoric mm -hmm. chemistry in. 
I, yeah, so, I, so I it's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I guess I guess in terms of uh, uh, chemistry. So the idea of the building is in in the twenty five years that it's like lifetime or within twenty five years, it should have paid itself off carbon. Um, uh, what you can't see from here, uh, the earlier picture was actually from the other side on the roof. Uh, on the other side of the building is uh, a load of solar panels. It basically fills the whole roof, and they're quite efficient once so the building at any one time generates way more energy than it uses and so yeah um over time and there's grass all over the roof as well so um <laughs> uh, within its within its lifetime it should have paid itself off basically uh, in terms of carbon but yeah the stuff that we do in there obviously um we need to you know start somewhere with chemistry um, and i would argue that this stuff uh in terms of making compounds like you know like these um rather than the free phosphines, which are horrendously pyrophoric themselves, you know, making a compound that's air stable um, is, I would argue, better. Um, you don't have to yeah. spend a load of money shipping it around if you're you know, transporting a, a hazardous substance like that. This is effectively, you know, happy in the, in the solid state. Yeah, I, it's, it's very interesting chemistry, but does someone mow the roof? Does, is it like... Yeah, yeah, grass I've got, on I've the got, roof. I've got a picture actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so every now, and then, every now and then they have uh, a team of guys that go up with, um, with yeah, not quite a normal lawnmower, but you know, like a skimmer type thing just to <laughs> uh, <laughs> mow the roof. Yeah, put that around. Right. Yeah. Um, Oliver, any questions from you? Uh, no, thank you. I mean, no, I'm fine. I, I'm just looking at the chat and. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we're good. Can I ask one while, while, while you're looking. Yeah. Um, how? So, so actually, this is the slide I had a question on. Um, back to the gas thing. Um, how careful do you have to be in terms of feeding in your hydrochloric acid? Um, is it kind of like does it violently degas this the stuff and like you get a really big pressure increase? Do you have to feed it slowly? Um, and then the follow-on to that is if you do create a really high pressure, does your actual, does the pressure of the system actually help or inhibit? Is it something that you have to kind of leak off or? Yeah, it's it's, it's really good questions. Yeah, so um, in general, what I do is uh, I add the, the HCl just all at once. Um, the It's not as quick a reaction as you might expect. So it's over around kind of, 10 to 15 minutes the gas is released so it's it's a, a much smoother kind of gas pressure increase um, than than you might expect with some things like i don't know adding it to um some hydride or something you know um to generate lots of hydrogen yeah it is actually fairly smooth there um presumably there's well the zinc phosphorus is not very soluble so it's just all on the surface so it does take time um and then the follow on there oh yeah it was about the pressure in the system so What's really good about this reaction um, is that it's uh, an SN1 type reaction. So we generate the carbon cations, and that's the kind of slow step of the reaction. So at a point, um, should we, what was, what was the point? Oh, yeah. So in theory, the, of course, the rate of an SN1 reaction doesn't depend on the concentration of the nucleophile, i.e., in this case, the pressure. Um, so actually, I've done this at kind of like half and a quarter of the scale in this reactor and it you get effectively the same amount of product uh, in all those cases and um, so you don't have to go crazy with the pressure um, uh, and you can buy much bigger versions of the reactor as well this is a uh, total volume of about 400 mils um, so you can oh, wow. go to okay. 20 20 millimoles of gas um, in that safely <laughs> Relative. yeah very cool very cool so I'm Brian. Uh, I am definitely the imposter here in this in this group, um, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, I, I kind of stumbled into main group chemistry. So I kind of wanted to, to pause a little bit on the on the periodic table and kind of talk about more specifically what I focus on is almost entirely in the group 16 uh, elements, so the calcogens. Um, so this is in the oxygen family. So if we go below, we have uh, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium, livermorium. Um, and so a lot of my research has started in sulfur and it's slowly drift down into selenium. Um, so 
the, the reason that for me, for, from, from the context of my research, that I find Group 16 super interesting, um, this might be a little controversial in present company, so maybe someone can correct me, but um, from an organic chemist point of view, and especially a polymer chemist point of view, which is ultimately what I am, um, the Group 16 elements, I would say, behave the most similarly to oxygen the further down you go. Um, so it, it's not unheard of to have, you know, a few stable thioketones. Um, there's even reports of a few stable selenoketones and even one or two of telurioketones. Um, you can have, you know, thioethers, selenoethers, telurioethers. So all of the classic functional groups that you can get with oxygen, there's been at least some reports of them with sulfur selenium tellurium. Um, at least on somewhat of a manageable scale. And manageable scale, what I mean by this is maybe, you know, not exploding, um, not necessarily needing a Schlenk line, um, which is something that I try to avoid if I can, because I was always a terrible organic chemist, which is why I became a polymer chemist. Um, so that's, this is essentially the group that I, that I focus on. Um, to kind of like super quickly give you a, a background on, on selenium more specifically, um, so selenium behaves very similarly to sulfur. Um, it's kind of this big, bulky, fluffy uh, element. Um, fluffy meaning that its, its radius is easy, easily electrolyzable. Um, it's about the size of bromine, if, if that helps. Um, there's a lot of different allotropes for selenium, um, red, black, and gray, the gray one sometimes being called the metallic version of selenium. Um, as well as a bunch of uh, stable isotopes. So selenium has uh, more than six isotopes total, but there are six that are stable um, within selenium. Um, and so this combination of a big radius, low electronegativity, um, and a lot of stable isotopes really gives selenium some really strange and interesting properties. Um, kind of from a historical context, if you look at elemental selenium, it was the first semiconductor, actually, um, before silicon surpassed it. Um, the the quote-unquote metallic, it's not necessarily a metal, but the metallic version of selenium um, is photoconductive, meaning the more radiation that you irradiate on it, the more conductive it becomes. Um, so because of this, this actually was the, the first report, the reported use of a photovoltaic material was actually uh, metallic selenium rods. Um, and so kind of diving into the organoselenium, these are maybe some of the more popular organoselenium compounds. Um, however, I have, I have this in here. The more cultured among you and the viewers may, might realize that you've heard the name selenium before, and that comes from the 2001 classic uh, evolution where they, they had to fight a nitrogen-based alien life form, and they realized that the selenium compounds in the head and shoulders dandruff shampoo was the, was the best poison to attack these aliens. Um, or also Xerox machines. That's maybe the other one that you've heard of them being in. Um, so I really like these, these elements. Um, I mentioned that I don't like to use a Schlenk line, um, and. I think something that maybe we've seen with both Tom and Andrew's talks is there's always a trade-off. So if you want to do really cool, funky chemistry, you have to give way for something else. And so I don't necessarily need a Schlenk line. I like to, uh, to do a lot of bucket chemistry. Um, so the trade-off for mine is everything in the group 16, it, it stinks. Um, it, it is metaphysically stinky. They are the smelliest compounds that you can imagine. Um, actually, they're, they're quite hard to imagine. The closest thing that you can imagine is maybe those that have been in the North America is maybe the smell of a skunk comes close, but some of the synthetic stuff is, uh, is, is really gnarly in terms of its smell. Um, so that's the trade-off, is you have to learn to work with this. Um, I do, I do want to read this one. This one comes from Derek Lowe's blog, um, Things I Will Never Work With, and I, I really find it funny. Um, so this is in, in, re, in regards to the chemical I have down here. So he mentions on one, the biggest stinker I have run across, imagine six skunks wrapped in a rubber inner tube and the whole thing is set ablaze that might approach the metaphysical stench of this material. Uh, or the, when benzoselenoic acid in solution is treated with a reducing agent such as hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, or best with zinc and hydrochloric acid, Selenophenol is obtained as a yellow oil with an overpowering and most nauseating odor. 
the odor of diethenyl selenide is extremely disagreeable, but is not nearly so bad as that of selenophenol. The effect of selenophenol on the skin is very similar to that of thiophenol, thiophenol forming blisters which itch intensely. After a time, these dry up, the skin scales off, and there appears to be a deposit of red selenium beneath it. The odor of selenophenol is very penetrating and is nauseating beyond description. Um, so I'm a glutton for punishment, and I have staked my claim in these, these elements, for better or for worse. Um, ultimately, though, if I do my chemistry correctly, it shouldn't smell so bad. Um, so this is, this is kind of the cartoon version of some of the chemistry I want to talk about. Um, I work with, I try whenever I can to work with elemental selenium, which is not smelly. Um, however, that trade-off comes with isocyanides, which are these kind of strange uh, sort of Zwitterionic sort of carbene in nature. Um, these are also extremely famous for being just fantastically smelly. Um, they, 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 they instantly, you can feel it in the back of your throat at just like a slight whiff. Um, they're not toxic, which is strange. They just are very, very smelly. Um, so what I've done is I've actually tried to do, I mentioned earlier that selenium behaves pretty similarly to sulfur. I've tried to uh, take advantage of that um, phenomena using selenium here. So um, this is this is essentially a modified version of a mechanism that's already pretty well known. Um, so if you start with these uh, these diisocyanides, this this kind of carbene-like carbon uh, will insert into the amorphous selenium, generate a isocyanate in situ because it's formed in the presence of an amine. It immediately reacts to form a selenourea. Um, and so here up here is the kind of the library that I've made. In fact, this picture of these two little vials here, this is actually the very first experiment I did. This was one of those kind of happy accidents that I tried on a Friday afternoon and came back on Monday um, and realized that it works. So the top one you notice is black. So this is just, uh, this is just elemental selenium I threw into a vial with a stir bar and was stirring essentially dirt. Um, and then came in on Monday and it had gone clear and it was kind of, the, the stir bar was, frozen and it was runny and kind of snotty and stretchy, which means that I, I, made some, I made some polymers. So why is this kind of interesting from a polymer point of view is, is selenium offers some really unique avenues towards characterizing soft matter materials. Um, so the first one that, I, that I'll highlight is, is XPS. So this is X-ray photon spectroscopy. This is typically not an instrument you would ever think to use to essentially analyze something stretchy. Um, or plasticky or anything. Um, but because of this really large atomic radius of selenium, you get this really great X-ray profile. Um, so we kind of coated our, our selenium snot onto a plate and we put it in the XPS. Um, and you can see that the percentage of selenium matches that of what we expected in our, in our polymer here. Um, so you can see the selenium 3S, the 3P and the 3D. Um, if we zoom in on the selenium 3D, that's this insert up here in the top left. Uh, we, can, we can use our computers and we can peak deconvolute this. So this, this shows that we have three separate species under this 3D peak. Um, so the black trace here um, is the selenone form. And so what I mean by a selenone is that's the version of what I have pictured here. The red trace underneath of it is the selenol tautomer. And so what this means is that the double bond goes from the nitrogen to the carbon, and you only have a single bond to the selenium with a, with a proton on it. So you have that selenol type structure. Um, and then the green peak underneath it is the selenic acid. So that would be the selenol plus an additional OH. Um, and what's really interesting about selenoureas is this kind of tautomerization, you can, you can see it directly here in the XPS, um, it's almost 50-50. Um, and so for any of you that know anything about ureas or thiureas, the, the equilibrium for that tautomerization is way greater than 99% in the own or the thion form. But with selenium, it's almost 50-50. So this is essentially constantly switching back and forth between um, a selenone and a selenol tautomer, which um, we're hoping to use for some really interesting chemistry. Um, the other thing that is um, pretty interesting um, is FTIR, so this is a pretty standard technique. This is most, most seniors in high school or first year uni students will start working with this. 
What's particular interesting is kind of the classic peak everyone tells you to look for is the carbon double bond oxygen or the carbon double bond sulfur. These are almost always between 1650 and 1750. Um, you slap a selenium in its place and it shifts all the way to 1550, but it's equally as strong and intense. Um, so this is another way that you can just really quickly just throw this into an FTIR and you instantly know that you, you have this reaction taking place because of that super unique uh, peak. And then so and so then I'll pause on the isotope pattern uh, taken from from the web elements page. Um, you'll see here this is the the six stable isotopes of selenium in their relative abundance and the relative intensity. Um, I put this here because um, as a polymer chemist, kind of the our bread and butter instrument that we use is a size exclusion chromatography instrument. This is essentially a polymer version of an HPLC. This means that our really big polymers will elute first and the really small ones will elute last. And so you kind of get this Gaussian curve. Um, the problem is that with ureas, thiureas, and also with selenoureas, um, they're not soluble in almost anything. Um, so I had this really cool data. And then when it came time to use uh, the polymer chemist's main, main instrument, I couldn't use it. So we had to try and find a way to get some sort of size and structure data without using the thing that gives us size and structure data. Um, so we have a really great mass spectrometry lab here at QUT, um, and I kind of posed this problem to them around the, the, the coffee machine. Um, and so one of the people in the mass spec lab says, yeah, for sure, I can get this to fly. Um, and so we did that, and you see these absolutely funky peaks. Um, and so what I mean by this, by, by a funky peak, this, this right here is kind of a broad zoom out version of this, this particular oligomer up here at the top. So you can see here, this is, this is the repeat unit. So this thing in brackets is 516.1. Um, and so that you see repeating at a regular basis. However, because you have so many stable isotopes in selenium, the more you add into a structure, the, the crazier your peak gets. So a, a simpler way to think of this is maybe with bromine. Bromine famously has two isotopes. So if you put in, you know, dibromobenzene, you're going to have four peaks corresponding to the two versions of bromine. So this is that phenomena only on a much bigger scale. And what's really cool is if, if we were just using carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, you would, you would be able to maybe build the structure and you would get a single peak here in the mass spec, but it doesn't necessarily tell you structural data because if you can if you can rearrange those atoms you can get the same peak in the mass spec right so um you can't really get structure data you can essentially only get its formula but with selenium because you know that it has to link in this fashion in that reaction you kind of get essentially instead of instead of maybe like a single dimensional barcode you can kind of think of this as like a two-dimensional barcode because you have the the isotopic pattern of selenium times the X number of seleniums on top of a huge polymer. And so you get this really hyper unique peak that you know has to be corresponded to whichever structure that you're, that you're looking at. So this is, this is really interesting. Um, we, we decided to kind of continue down that rabbit hole um, and we got into collision induced mass spectrometry. So this is essentially the same thing that you just saw. Um, but what this does is our mass spec instrument, as it's analyzing it in the, in the chamber, we can kind of tell it to lock on to a very specific weight. So if we, if we go back and we look at this one, we can say, you know, all, we can tell the computer only look at mass that is uh, 1,469.4, it says, okay. It'll, it'll latch on to that, um, that ion and it'll send it into a second chamber. And then it really just vibrates it with a lot of energy. Um, I think we run this in a helium environment, um, really, really hot, and then, it, it, and then it rips apart. So what we found is this is the, the pattern that it kind of rips apart into. Um, and so here's an oligomer that we picked. So we picked 883.2 in this particular example, which corresponds to this. So this is your incoming peak. It goes into that second CID chamber, and then it just gets battered around like crazy, and it starts ripping apart. And so you see it split apart, it kind of cracks open like an egg, and then you have all of these peaks that correspond to the slice that it took. And this is where selenium gets really interesting because, you know, again, if you only had carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, this would be 
much, much harder to, to figure out which pieces go where. But because you can zoom in to each individual piece, you can essentially ask the computer, okay, does this match something with one selenium, two seleniums, three seleniums, so on and so forth. It goes, ah, okay, this is, this is four. And then so, ah, you go, okay, I have four, so I have to go one, two, three, four. Okay, then that means it has to break here. And so you get these really super exact pinpoint areas that you can narrow it down to, um, which, is, which is really, really interesting. Um, ultimately, though, we, we still had to convince reviewers that these polymers were the size that we said they were. Um, so we actually got to use another technique that I think maybe polymer chemists will be familiar with. I don't know so much about um, the classic organic chemists. Maybe they do, maybe it's used a little bit differently. But we use um, a two-dimensional NMR technique. So this is diffusion-ordered spectroscopy. Um, there are a few solvents that these polymers are soluble in, one of them being DMSO, so dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, the problem is, is that there are no calibration curves for dozy NMR using selenoureas. So first we had to build one. Um, and then after we built our calibration curve, we can put this in the, the dozy NMR spectrometer. And, and what's happening here is you, you tell the NMR instrument that, um, you know, you say, okay, this is the signal I want you to lock in onto. And then the NMR instrument assumes that this is a solid sphere in solution. And it says, okay, there's my signal. And then it'll send a pulse. It'll wait a set amount of time. And then it'll pulse again and look for that same signal. And then it looks to see how far it's diffused in solution. Um, and so what you can do is you can take this diffusion in solution and you can use, um, so let's see, this is the, the Stokes-Einstein equation. And you can um, back calculate how fast that sphere would be diffusing. And then that correlates to roughly how big that sphere has to be um, through a couple visc viscometric translations. So ultimately we were able to show that um, these are polymers, um, not necessarily oligomers. So these were ranging anywhere from uh, over 6,000 um, Daltons or 6,000 grams per mole all the way up to 100,000. Um, so, so for sure we have, we have polymers in this and so, um, yeah, this is some of the selenium chemistry that I'm doing. Um, this is our group. Um, so I'm one of two junior group leaders in the group. This is the soft matter lab. I'm going to do a shameless plug here while, while I have, have the time. Um, so these were a group of about 30 or 40 PhD students. Um, me and uh, Dr. Hendrik Frisch are the two junior group leaders, and then we're led by uh, Professor Christopher barnick -Vallick. Um pictured here, as well as uh, Professor James Blinko. Um, for those in Australia at the moment, if you're interested, we are always interested in interested PhD students or postdocs, so give us an email, uh, and then you can also follow us up here on social media. We're very bad at it, but we do our best. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, someone asked in the chat uh, what the benefits of selenium are over oxygen other than the MS. Right. So some of the things that you can think of that you can do with selenium is selenium being such a big bulky element um, lends itself to doing maybe something more nucleophilic. So um, there is a, a thiol synthesis that requires you using um, thiourea. You can add it in the presence of a base. That sulfur does an SN2 reaction, and then you essentially dehydrate what you that 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 kind of intermediate thiourea complex. And dehydrating it leaves you with a thiol instead of maybe the alkyl bromine or alkyl chlorine that you have. With selenium, this is even faster. Um, so a selenol's selectivity towards an alkyl bromine is extremely fast. Um, if any of you know the term click chemistry, it approaches click chemistry conditions. So this is chemistry that's happening under within seconds um, with yields greater than 90. Um, so these are some things that we want to do with this. The, we also want to explore some material properties that you can't get with oxygen. Um, so I mentioned the X-ray cross, the X-ray um, attenuation coefficient of selenium. Um, so you can picture maybe you can get this into some sort of shielding materials that are still stretchy and pliable like normal plastics or normal elastomers. So maybe, you know, the joke in our lab is that Brian is the one creating space underwear because I'll be able to make spandex that is uh, attenuates x-rays. 
I'm not quite to space underwear. I've tentatively, <laughs> I'm going to call it spundies. Um, so we'll see. So keep your eye out for spundies in the future. <laughs> Um, I've I'm, also got a question about um, your projects with Tellurium. What are you planning to do? Similar yeah. stuff or something entirely different? Um, so so Tellurium um, are definitely not that stable. Um, Selenoureas took a little bit of finesse to get those stable. Um, but with um, Tellurium, there's some interesting um, sigma hole kind of secondary bonding interactions that we want to explore um, that are kind of stabilized by some carbene structures and some nitrogen structures um, that also we are looking at x-ray attenuation stuff with that um, and you can also do some really interesting photochemistry that's another thing that our group is famous for is a lot of photochemistry i don't have any of that here today um, but uh, tellurium is so big and fluffy that it is, it, it basically just doesn't mind holding on to an extra radical. It doesn't, you know, normally the small elements in the main group get very grumpy when you tell them to hold on to a radical, but selenium and tellurium are kind of like, yeah, sure. Um, so a little bit of photo excitation can get you to some really interesting radical chemistry as well. Question about uh, the mass spec. Um, is it like, what's the sample prep like for that? Because I'm not really familiar with it. Like if your stuff doesn't dissolve, do you, do you need it to be dissolved for mass spec or is it like? Uh, yeah, so this, this yeah. was in and of itself quite the challenge. Um, so what we did here is you'll, you'll notice that the repeat unit, I've actually put it up here, it's only two. So this is actually quite small. For me anyway, this is quite small. Um, I'm used to that number saying, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, so what we've done is, is we've dissolved it in DMSO and what, what we'll do is we'll take a small drop of DMSO and so the, the mass spec that we use is an electrospray ionization mass spec and essentially as that's getting injected into the spray chamber we're also co-injecting methanol to try and get a good uh, droplet breakup because um, DMSO doesn't really like to ionize very well it doesn't make a good spray but methanol does but it's not soluble in methanol so essentially what you get is a compromise between these two solvents, only showing you the oligomers. Um, so it, it took some finesse, but we did get it to fly a little bit in the mass spec. <laughs> All right. Yeah, cool. Do, yeah. Does, does, the, does the polymer have a smell to it with a little selenium in it? Or is it? Well, this is very fine. It's great, actually. Um, so you know that you've done it right when it doesn't smell. Um, but what's really interesting is I, I noticed, I forget if it was Andrew or Tom, they, they showed a picture of an old 60s uh, German uh, Chemische Berichte paper. Um, and I was reading one of those and it, it, was, it was fantastic. You're reading it and it's talking about this really gnarly synthesis of a selenium compound. And then in just all caps, it just says, I'm translating, caution, if you do this, you'll make hydrogen selenide and you will die. <laughs> um, so if you if if you do something wrong and you start to see bubbles in your solution and you smell something that smells horrendously bad, you know that you've added the wrong compound and to shut your fume hood and let it finish doing whatever it's doing. <laughs> have you smelled hydrogen cyanide? I have. Um, it's not good. It, it so <laughs> you know <laughs> smell to H2S. There, there there is an old conversation between Linus Pauling and one of his uh, Men, uh, mentees, Mike Malison. So he was the one that did the, it's the quoted, it's called the, the most beautiful experiment in biology. Um, and he wanted to originally make tellurium compounds. So tellurium also being in group 16, hyper smelly. And the, the I'm paraphrasing the conversation, Linus Pauling essentially was like, are you sure you want to make some of these? And he was like, well, yeah, I think this would be really cool. And he said, okay, well, you know how bad hydrogen selenide, uh, sulfide smells, right? He goes, well, yeah. He goes, Hydrogen selenide smells that much worse than hydrogen sulfide. And hydrogen telluride smells even that much worse than selenide. Um, and he, he told them, and this is a true thing, it's called tellurium breath. So for people that work with oh, yeah. selenium compounds and tellurium compounds too long, um, so what happens is you get the gas, it goes into your mucous membranes, your body breaks it down into either elemental selenium or elemental tellurium, but the only way to get it back out of your system is to remake the, hydro, the hydrogen versions of it. And so even with small doses of it, your breath will perpetually smell like just hyper rancid garlic for days. 
And you, doesn't it come out your sweat as well? Does it just yeah, sweat? Yeah, it comes out your sweat, it comes out of your mucous membranes. If you get a really bad dose, like a, a, a really severe acute dose of hydrogen selenide, um, your eyes turn red because elemental selenium starts uh, crashing out of your mucous membranes. That's horrible. <laughs> That's awful. So luckily, I don't work with it on a big enough scale. And I'm not <laughs> yeah, good. That bad of a chemist, but. <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely horrible. <laughs> yeah. I had some questions about like the general synthesis and some of the starting materials that you use. So it doesn't seem that isocyanides aren't probably particularly easy to make or that widely available. Is there like alternative routes to these? Can you make polyureas first and then convert them afterwards to the uh, selenoureas? Um, a kind of a kind of a good rule of thumb when it comes to anything that I'm doing, um, if you see the structure on the screen, then you know it was pretty easy to make because I'm not the best organic chemist. Just just full disclosure. I, so isocyanides are actually somewhat easy to make. Um, the typical synthesis is you will start. So actually, this top one in the top left is commercially available. At least it used to be. Um, but the bottom one I made. So you'll usually start with a primary amine. You'll reflux it with um, um, ethyl formate, so you kind of get the formamide, and then you dehydrate the formamide with uh, phosphorus oxychloride. So you, you do you do that dehydration, and then you're left with this. Um, it's a shame I didn't have time to talk about how smelly these are because these are also just they're so so smelly. So um, I'm the stinky kid in our lab. I definitely <laughs> have my own corner in the lab. Everyone blames me if there's a bad smell, um, but if you're willing to have your nose offended, you can do some pretty interesting chemistry. How is yes. polonium smell? Well, polonium. Right. <laughs> well, so that would probably kill you. So. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to ask probably uh, the KGB. They're the ones that yeah, yeah, exactly. polonium <laughs> chemistry. Um, that's how they used to poison people. Uh, they put it in tea, and then you would have uh, radiation poisoning over the course of many months until you would die a very slow, agonizing death. Yeah, I remember that. So, so yeah, no, I'm I'm probably going to stop at tellurium. I don't think I will venture into polonium territory. Are there actually any people who are doing oh, I got, um, polonium? I got a sh I got a shout out my friend Jarrah, who I'm fairly sure watches these, who's a, a lab mate who does some polonium stuff, or not what? so much anymore. Anyone who works with it does refer to it as a bitch of an element. No one likes working with it. It's terrible. Yeah. But, what, but you can detect it very easily because because of its high re radio radioactivity. What scales does it work on? Oh, like uh, they always refer to it as like, you know, in, in the radioactive things. And once they actually convert it to moles or whatever, it's, it's just stupidly like, low. Yeah. It's like micrograms. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not micrograms. No. Nah. Less. Really? Like, Yeah. Yeah, like it's it's. I'll get him on one of these episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking about his research. I've probably got it wrong. <laughs> but yeah, no. But anyway, it was oh, it was a tangent. But I know he'd, he'd get angry at me if I didn't mention his polonium work. <laughs> polonium was getting mentioned. No, cool. I think that's it for questions. Uh, we, have you ever ever smelled someone with selenium breath? Uh, no. Um, no one else in my lab is really willing to work with selenium. Um, and I fortunately, so, so Tom earlier mentioned the same technique that I use is I usually have a bleach, uh, off gasser. So my reaction vessels usually always as a backup will be bubbled into bleach. So if I accidentally quench something, it quenches into bleach and then it just crashes out as, um, elemental selenium. You actually can do some interesting chemistry with bleach on these selenoureas. You can actually selectively remove selenium and you leave behind, um, a carbodiamide in its place, which is something that will we're doing right now. Um, um, and actually this is, this is the primary kind of, th this, this actual chemistry of dehydrating it into carbodiamides is, um, that, that's essentially what my DECRA is about at the moment. So this is my actual independent stuff. Um, so as soon as my students can come from overseas, I hope to have some of this, this stuff published soon, so. Thank you. Well, I think you can Thanks stop much. sharing your screen and we can move on to general questions. Each of you, what would you say Comparing when you're comparing other fields, what, what would you say? What's one big pro of this field? Getting you know to work the field, and what's one you know big sort of con, big negative? So if someone's trying to you know considering a research group to join or something, and then asking you know what's the what's the biggest positive, what's the biggest negative about working in, in this sort of field? 
what would you say it is? Um, I would say for mine is it smells so bad that not many people are willing to work in it. So there's plenty of stuff to find. Um, there's a lot of papers from the 60s and 70s, and then everyone got smart and realized that they no longer wanted to make smelly chemistry. Um, so I'm just picking up where they left off in the 60s and 70s. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's why I like it. There's lots of really interesting stuff. And mine, anyway, I feel is a little bit more approachable for someone with a background in like kind of hardcore synthetic organic chemistry or polymer chemistry because the stuff translates pretty well to what you already know. You don't have to really, you know, if, if you're really bad at, you know, at, uh, Lewis acid based chemistry or ligand design or that kind of stuff because it never was your favorite, at least the group 16 elements are a little bit more approachable this way. The con, I think I've mentioned plenty, is the smell. <laughs> That's the pro and the con. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so I'd, I'd say for me, like, a big um, pro is I, I, I just find making new stuff fascinating. Um, you know, things that haven't been made before. Uh, and especially, it, you know, when you submit a crystal to the crystallographer and, you know, in however many days or whatever it comes back, and you just see, you know, evidence, direct evidence, you know, I've made this thing that no one's made before. That feeling is just really exciting for me. Um, and I think with a lot of main group chemistry, there's a lot of that kind of, I've made this, it's, it's brand new, you know, no one's made, say, a bond between element X and element Y before, you know, no, one, no one's done this before, or I've made the shortest of this bond, I've made the longest of this bond, <laughs> um, lots, lots of that kind of stuff. Um, for me as well, yeah, working with, uh, phosphine gas, lots of that chemistry is quite old, um, as similar, similar to what Brian was just saying. Like, there's some very interesting papers going back to like 60s and before, just looking through. Uh, and in fact, yeah, I'm just looking through those for other things to do with the gas as well. Um, and there's some other stuff on the horizon um, that I'm doing. So, yeah, watch this space for that. Uh, and, and then in terms of a con, yeah, uh, yeah. handling things and setting up reactions. <laughs> Actually, similar to what uh, Andrew was saying earlier, um, it's it's not just that you can decide you're going to set a reaction up, <clears throat> and half an hour later it's it's set up. You know, including doing your risk assessment and stuff. Um, it's very much a process. <laughs> yeah, my stuff is similar to what Tom had said. So yeah, the excitement of making something new and challenging what people had previously said. So for some of the examples I showed, there was. I think it was in an old paper which said like you just can't make multiple bonds between heavy main group elements. It was stated that you can't do that. And as soon as one was made, then obviously that challenged that. And since then, there's been a lot more developments in that. So all these like ideas that we once had are just being constantly challenged by main group chemistry. And the development is so fast. You see in examples of metal-free dinitrogen activation catalysis that was usually only limited to transition metals. So it's all, you're kind of rewriting the textbooks all the time. It makes it a challenge to teach this stuff, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's it's such a f fresh and exciting field that has so much development. And again, the challenge is like making these compounds, they're like so-called impossible molecules or molecules that shouldn't exist. And that means you might not actually be able to ever make them. And you can spend months, years, <laughs> a long time trying to make some of these compounds. And you might just be doing one little thing wrong and it's going to be difficult to identify what that issue is. So I think main group chemistry is what I kind of like and dislike about it is that on paper, it looks so simple. There's never any fancy catalyst or additive. It's A plus B goes to C and it's obvious how you get there. But finding the ligands or substituents or the conditions to get there that's the big challenge and something that again is very hard to predict it's just building off what's previously been done or what you know works for certain systems thank you well all of you are doing super exciting chemistry um, <laughs> yeah i mean we do say that to every guest but we do mean it. <laughs> well, <laughs> quick break from main chemistry for a moment because we've got two postdocs here well no one Postdoc or research fellow, I suppose. Just have some comment on like what that pathway was like and 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 everything. We've talked about people going to a PhD, but you know, going on from that. And I mean, you're you're a DECRA fellow. You know, what's the DECRA process like? You know, that's an Australian thing, right? 
I, I know it's a very big question. <laughs> I've just asked there, but like, what's you know, what, what's the what's the post PhD life been like? Being kind of in that that middle ground away from the PhD, I, the the pains and struggle of being a PhD student are still very fresh in my mind. I I can appreciate how little you get paid as a PhD student on a PhD scholarship and how frustrating you know 80 hour work weeks can be. Um, I would say that if, if science is something that you like though, if you can just stick with it, I would say for me anyway, my postdoc experience was, my first year as a postdoc was the greatest scientific year of my life. I mean, my job was to go in the lab and make stuff. I didn't, I didn't have to go to meetings. I didn't have to <laughs> turn in my thesis or worry about panel members or anything. Um, so if you like to do science, then I would recommend doing a postdoc, even if you don't want to go into academia, I would recommend it. Um, a year as a postdoc is never going to hurt you. If academia is something that you want to do, so for me, this is this is something that I wanted to do. Um, I would say that um, you know, the, the climate that we live in now is still, and this is something you're all familiar with, is still very much publish or perish. Um, so you do need to be publishing as much as you can for better or for worse. I won't get into if I think that's a good or a bad thing, but that's, if that's where you want to go, that's what you have to do. This, this is kind of waxing poetically, I guess, for me, but this was the ultimate question I had about my, my 18 months into my postdoc was, do I want to have my weekends back and get paid a lot more money to do someone else's idea? Or do I want to take the pay cut to do my own ideas? And so for me, that answer was, I want to do my own ideas. You know, Tom and um, Andrew both mentioned, you know, the, the making stuff for me is awesome. I love to make stuff. Um, so there, there's something kind of nice about wrestling a secret away from the universe. Um, that's just something that I really like, something that no one has done. Um, so that's kind of what it is. But, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting paid six figures to go work Monday through Friday in the industry. I mean, that's that's a really nice gig. And it's, it's one that I think about all the time when I'm struggling <laughs> writing grants and, and reading yeah. thesis and going on panel reviews and stuff. So it's a little bit of a grass is always greener, maybe. But these are kind of maybe some of the things that I've thought about, if that helps anyone that's listening um, and kind of the process that I've, I've been in. Now you're, as a research fellow, I suppose it's, it's your working for yourself now. I mean, you're, you're getting your own grants for your own lab. The, the DECRA, so this is, DECRA is Dis Discovery of Early Career Research Awards. So this is something a little bit unique to Australia. Roughly similar things in Europe, for example, would be maybe the Emmy Nota program, which is, I think, five years for a couple million dollars to start your own independent group. Um, let's, I, I forget the American ones off the top of my head because it's been so long since I've been home. Um, but so this one is not quite as independent as that, but it's definitely more independence than a postdoc. So I have two students that I've already hired. Uh, they were granted their student visas to travel here 25 hours before Australia shut its borders. So they didn't quite sneak in under the radar, unfortunately. But, um, I do have my own students. We're going to be doing our own research. But at the same time, you know, my, my DECRA mentor is the head of our soft matter, uh, soft matter materials lab. So that's... Um, Professor Christopher Barnett-Kowalik. Um, he's also the DBCR of QUT. So um, that's Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research for the non-Australians. Um, so yeah, it's you're, you're, you're an independent group leader with training wheels. I think it's maybe the best way to, to put it. Oh, yeah. Talk now, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, for me, like for postdoc in, it was, you kind of, at least for like my first one in Edinburgh, it was like fantastic as that example of, yeah, you just get to essentially get paid just to make stuff and do cool stuff, but you don't have the, you don't have the burden of having to write a thesis, which obviously is everyone's worry of drawing a PhD, even though in the long run, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, I'm on my third postdoc at the minute, so you get lots of different experience. So that's part of the good thing about doing different postdocs, you want to kind of move into a different field each time. So my PhD was on sulfur nitrogen radicals, then I did phosphorus and boron chemistry. And then when I moved to uh, Toronto, I was doing more materials based chemistry and now I do S block chemistry. So you get to do different chemistry. And I guess 
what is both the best and worst thing about academia is you're always moving or it's very short term but at the same time that means that you get to travel to cool places um in my fourth country uh like just from this job uh and you get to meet a lot of cool people as well doing that so that's something that you wouldn't really get in a lot of other jobs or an industry that's very static obviously if that's doesn't appeal to everyone and under the circumstances you might not be able to do that but that's what I kind of like about postdoc and it's just it's class as training but I think you can have fun doing that and get into the the goal of becoming an academic and then and then Tom I suppose that I'll ask the rude question about what it, what it, what are your plans post PhD uh, as I mentioned I'm sort of very much organic chemist by sort of previous training and a lot of what I do now. Um, so, you know, if, if need be, uh, I could go into a job in, you know, hopefully into something like a pharmaceutical company, you know, um, and I'd be happy doing that kind of stuff. There are companies around the world that work with phosphine gas, for example, um, in a slightly different way to, to what I do, but um, it, is, it is used industrially, uh, for sure. Um, in terms of what I want to do next, I think, I guess similarly to to um, uh, Brian and Andrew, that, yeah, I'll be looking at postdocs. Um, I've put in a couple of applications at the minute, um, and so we're just waiting to see what happens there. Um, and I think long term, because uh, one of the other things I really do like is passing on what I know to other people. That's why I, I like doing things like this. Um, and so ultimately, going into lecturing in academia is something that I'd like to do um obviously it's a long path but uh it'll be interesting i think so is is yeah. pharma like the the big employer from from this field you say is it pharma or is it i don't know every I bit of everywhere well, I'd say in, in, certainly for organic uh, uh organic chemists as the uh, pharmaceutical or agrochemical or uh, um, those sorts of things thanks uh <laughs> where do you see your specific fields in 10 years yeah, ten years. So if you because if you think about w what people were doing ten years ago and to, to now, what do you think you know a, a standard researcher would be doing in, in ten years' time? Or exotic bonds. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. It's like the compounds that, like in the last 10, 20 years, were like the, I guess the title compound of the paper. They're now being used to do useful things. If that makes sense. So, it's kind of yeah that's kind of where stuff is going and there's been so many developments that are like kind of just pushing on the boundaries of what we know so in 10 years time I wouldn't be surprised if we have a, tr a metal free or a main group catalyst that can do uh, the harbour boss process so taking dinitrogen and reducing it to ammonia it won't be as active it, it, whatever it's going to be more difficult to make it's probably going to be sensitive but we're not necessarily trying to replace transition metals like they're there for a reason and they're good but again it's pushing boundaries and they might be replaced but there's also this complementary reactivity that's often overlooked like you don't want to replace something if it's good i know it might be expensive and toxic but maybe you can do something different i, I can say what i would what i would where i would like it to be i guess in, in 10 years yeah. One of my favorite things about polymer chemistry is um, you, you almost don't have to think about the fact that you're using carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, because the structures that you're making are, are, are infinite. I mean, you can make branches, uh, you can make brushes, you can make donuts, you can make, I mean, these are all terms that we have in our literature. When you're kind of presented with this infinite array of structures that you can make, you kind of forget that you're only using carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So if 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 I could have a, a wish, it would be that not only would we have all of these infinite structures that we can build, we can build them with other elements to almost where you get to where it's almost difficult to maybe decide, is that a plastic or a metal? Maybe it's so, maybe it's something new. Maybe it's, it's maybe you have so much selenium and tellurium inside of a stretchy spandex that it, you, you don't really have a good word for it anymore because you, maybe it's sort of photoconductive, but it's also stretchy, but it's also it can self-heal itself, you know, these really strange things, um, you know, 
basically encourage people to be, you know, the, the Marco Polo of, of the elements, at least for the polymer chemists who are too afraid to usually go exploring beyond that first row. Um, so I'd say the thing with phosphorus in particular is that ultimately um, the uh, diagram that uh, Andrew showed earlier with the uh, supplies and things, phosphorus is one of those elements that's kind of considered that it, there might be problems with supply in the future. So there's definitely um, a drive to come up with more sustainable ways to use it and then potentially reuse it as well as kind of using less processing. So as I mentioned, lots of reactions start with PCL3 often as a, as a starting material, which ultimately you take phosphate rock out of the ground, reduce it to white phosphorus and then react it with chlorine gas at very high temperature to make PCL3. There's lots of work going into kind of taking step back from that. So uh, using P4 white phosphorus directly from, you know, straight from reduction to avoid the chlorination step, which means you don't have to deal with a, a reactor that I'm sure is horrific to maintain that, that deals with phosphorus <laughs> and chlorine, you know. Um, and, uh, and even, you know, going to kind of phosphate rock and using phosphates to do organic chemistry with this, something that's coming in as well. So a push to more sustainable processes, I think, is starting. Um, and then obviously there's the usual, we'll be making funkier and funkier molecules <laughs> with, uh, with phosphorus in, of course, as, as time goes on. And are, are we holding you to these, by the way? Are we 10 years' time, are you can back to the footage, having picked through the you know, main group literature, like, I don't understand any of this, but I've got to see if they're right. I think we're, we're oh, yeah, yeah, look at yeah, time, look at time. All right, all right. Oh, we've been going oh, for two hours. hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you around. Around. Yeah, any final words from you guys? Or Well, I'll link your social medias, you know, in, in the description area. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I guess if people have questions and things, then um, feel free to get in touch on, on Twitter or on, you know, um, whatever other, you know, ask questions in the comments if whenever this goes on YouTube, et cetera. Um, I'm sure we'll all be there or trying. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and you've got papers. People can read your papers too. You know, it's important. You know, there's more information in your papers. People are interested. Thanks thanks for having us. This was super fun. Um, I always like talking about my chemistry. Um, <laughs> I definitely learned so much. I'm going to forget of some of the stuff that I learned listening to Andrew and Tom. Um, always reach out on social media if you have questions. I also mentioned our group is constantly looking for PhD students and postdocs, so it never hurts to send an email. Um, yeah. Tom, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. can you start doing some in group chemistry yourself? <laughs> Oh, no. You had, uh, you've not been motivated. You've not had the inspiration. You can buy oh, no. poison and do some chemistry. I think. I think I because I had an incident, an incident <laughs> with because uh, I was trying to convert white phosphorus into red. And then I was using something to, some terrible idea to like, oh, I'll just strip the white phosphorus off, react the white phosphorus away and leave leave the red, seeing as it's mostly red, but it was mostly white. And it was like, <laughs> wow, he's cooking garlics here. And I was like, oh, this is a bad idea. And <laughs> and I don't think I've been back ever since. I don't think a, an experiment has viciously tried to kill me as much as that one. <laughs> So, yeah, I, <laughs> I haven't quite <laughs> done a lot of metal since then. Some of, uh, some of those phos uh, phosphorus groups on your Cubane synthesis. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to go there. Oh, no. That's going to take a couple of years to finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. People keep asking me for updates, like, you finished yet? Like, no, <laughs> I haven't even started the next thing. <laughs> what about you? What, uh, one MCP or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, we all comment like, oh, is there any updates? I'm like, mate, it's only been two and a half years, all right? Give me a chance, all right? Ooh, I'm yeah. super tempted to do that kind of main group chemistry at my uh, at home, but my I don't think my Schlenklein would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying goodbye. Yep, all right. Thank uh, thanks, chat, as well. Thanks, for people turning up and asking questions. It's always excellent to see. Always very helpful. So, yeah, all right. Uh, and see you in a month. Hopefully. Oh, and if anyone yeah. wants to uh, participate, then send us a DM on Twitter. Yeah, we're always looking for people. We've got a list of people and we try and group them and, you know, um, saves me harassing people as well on Twitter because um, I don't like being ignored. But yeah, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, excellent. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks,